the next day, I thought it might be a good time to ask about the war. Judging by the look on everyone's faces, it wasn't. Well, the war, said Mr. Silton. Barry, interrupted his wife, can I see you for a minute? And dragged Mr. Silton out of the room, leaving me with Mr. Preston. All of a sudden, Mr. Silton appeared. How about a tune-up, he said. Mrs. Silton started to make some food, and Mr. Preston was playing with the dog. <coughs> Leaving me to chat with Mr. Silton, I said that I really wanted to see everyone else, but Mr. Silton said that it wouldn't be that easy. Traveling now, especially for a robot, is complicated. Go back to the house, you could even do some cleaning. Wait there and I'll work out a way to get you to each of them. I told him that I couldn't get into the main house because the hallway ceiling had collapsed. I have just the thing, said Mr. Silton, as he pulled some sort of card out of his pocket. If you can get into the caves under the house, you can use this security pass to get into the old man's laboratories. You can get into the main house that way. I was so excited. I would be able to get back into my old room, I said thanks, and made my way to the front door. Also, I think you might be able to help us out, said Mr. Silton, but we'll meet up back at the old man's house in a couple of days, you head there and we'll see you soon. door was sealed shut. I wasn't sure how to get inside. I wasn't sure what to do with this machine. I took the fisherman's boat to the old man's estate.
As I walked through the old church ruins, I was surprised to hear Mr. Silton calling me. He said he had forgotten to give me something, and the church's community hall would be the perfect place to try it out. As soon as we walked into the hall, Mr. Silton said he had a present for me. It was a pair of Atlas gloves. They made me think of the old blind man with the cat, and his stolen Atlas gloves. I wonder if Mr. Silton knew how lucky he was to still have them with a glove thief around. Mr. Silton asked me to try the gloves on and start chucking things around. But not him. He was very clear about that. Mr. Silton suggested we clean the hall. Of course I knew when he said we, he meant me. But I was happy to try out my new gloves. He said I should clear everything off of the basketball court and put the things on the floor either side. I fiddled with the settings for a bit, but when Mr. Silton saw I was having trouble, he fished a small manual out of the box. He explained that pressing down and X would pick a thing up. X would then throw the thing, and if I wanted to place it on the floor, I should again press down and X. He looked more and more confused as he read all this but eventually he finished by saying, well, I hope that made more sense to you than it did to me. Let's see what else these gloves can do, said Mr. Silton as he flicked through the manual. He actually looked quite excited when he explained that holding X while walking into or under a falling thing would allow me to catch it. 
I must admit, I was then really happy when he suggested we make it a game, and I try to catch 10 basketballs. Mr. Siltrant suggested we make it a real game, and see how quickly I could score 10 baskets. I enjoyed this so much. It felt just like the good old days. Except Mr. Siltrant wasn't as forgiving as the old man. When I'd scored 10 baskets, Mr. Silton gave me what he called a high five. He said I now knew everything about the gloves and I should be able to continue through the basement of the church into the house. When I asked him if he was coming with me, he just laughed and said they would catch up with me in the main hall.
I was stood in a gigantic cavern. When I looked down, I was horrified to see hundreds of corpses of those things. As horrible as it sounds, my steptochip said they were things to clean. So clean them I would. That must be the door Mr. Silton talked about. The door was exactly as Mr. Silton had described it. I just hoped that the card he had given me was the security key and not just some backstage pass. Well it opened the door. But soon an alarm went off. Something caught my eye. It was a small yellow sphere. The book next to it explained that it was a shield that would automatically take a hit for me when activated. The Y button took the shield in and out of storage, meaning I could save it for when the going got tough. It seemed that I started with two slots to carry shields, but I could upgrade to be able to carry more. If both I and the shield died in the same room, the Lazarus chip would bring us both back. It's almost as if the shield needed its sacrifice to mean something. It felt like a true friend proving that even the simplest of faces can bring out an emotional reaction.
Something literally caught my eye. I remembered the old man had installed some software that helped show me things that were interactive, and how to interact with them. This must be what he was talking about. The electron gun blew the power. I needed to turn it back on, before I could fire again. seemed quite valuable. Wow, this was clearly worth something. The video recorder's blinking light caught my eye. It must have been years since I had seen a film or TV show. Maybe I could take a little break from my quest and watch the film on the tape. As the video started, I was surprised to see the old man. Hello hello, he bellowed in his familiar tone, this is test number, um, 107C. He continued as he read from a clipboard. This unit still has three major issues. 1. The shell is so incredibly thick that the whole machine is still far too large and heavy. 2. The missile system is too unpredictable and aggressive. And 3. The trade-off between power and intelligence is far too great. I think the military capabilities would be far too dangerous in the wrong hands. I think we would be best to push forward with the Innocence Project. I didn't really understand a word of what he said. And I was slightly disappointed that he had recorded over the film, but it was nice to see the old man's face again. I wasn't sure what was going on, but suddenly, inanimate objects started to come to life.
I should try picking that up. come in all the shapes and sizes.
Seeing another VCR made me wonder if there were any more recordings of the old man. I rummaged behind the TV, and was not surprised to find two more dusty old tapes. One just had hours of some strange sport. But the other had a recording of the old man. Hello, hello, came his voice again, right, this is urgent. Cancel the nanobot program immediately, all production to be stopped. Contain the remaining units in these corrosion-proof canisters. Although I'm sure it's obvious, the old man continued. We have discovered that they are essentially unstoppable and can form a controlling intelligence around any object. Need I say more? Well, at least that explained why everything moved with minds of their own. I'd never been in this part of the house before, but I figured I would get back to more familiar surroundings once I made it through these laboratories. Thank <laughs> you.
I needed to get back on the moving lift. Chuckled Mr. Silton. It's alright, we'll claim it on the insurance as accidental damage. Get me a new TV as well. I explained to them that I had found some of the old man's home videos, and the contents had shocked me. The dirty old bugger! Interrupted Mr. Silton. But I didn't know what he meant. So I continued explaining about the nanobots, and Mr. Silton said we needed to get our sharpest minds on the case. Not you dipshit, he barked at Mr. Preston, we need to rescue Heather and her mum. I wasn't sure what Mr. Silton meant by rescue, but I thought I would leave them to clear up. The weather felt cold and ominous as we made our way back outside. Before we meet the others, I need you to help me get my stolen van back, explained Mr. Silton. It's going to be dangerous, and we need someone expend, uh, dependable. The equipment was heavy, but I was happy to help pack the large boxes until Preston returned with what Mr. Silton called, the mean machine. <laughs> <laughs> 